All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video we're going to finish up and we're going to cover the re female reproductive cycle and just an overview since we've already gone over it in great detail. Okay, so let's go ahead and just do a nice, nice little quick recap. So if you remember, inside of the ovary, we have what's called a diploid parent stem cell, right, that oogonium. And if you remember, you have all of these at birth that you're ever going to have for the rest of your life. Now, what happens is before you hit puberty, those oogoniums are undergoing mitosis, right? undergoing excessive mitosis and producing tons of these little primordial follicles. These primordial follicles are just primary oocytes, right? Which have this single layer of uh, simple squamous-like follicular cells around it. And it's still a primary oocyte, so it's frozen in prophase one. And then what happens is, once you hit puberty, these primordial follicles, a certain amount of them, uh, due to the localized androgens in the area, are converting this primordial follicle into a primary follicle. Right? And then if you remember what happens to that primary follicle, he gets converted into an early secondary to a late secondary into a graphene. Who triggers that? Okay, we gotta come up to the hypothalamus. If you remember in the hypothalamus, there was the arcuate nucleus, and then there was the preoptic nucleus. Once you hit puberty, they start releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone. This gonadotropin releasing hormone stimulates the anterior pituitary of these gonadotropes, right, to release FSH and LH. Now. FSH, what is it going to do? It's going to stimulate the conversion of a primary follicle into an early secondary, an early secondary into a late secondary, and then a late secondary into a graphene follicle. So what is it doing? It's causing, if you notice, this is a single layer. This is multiple layers. That's more layers. Has some follicular fluid, and then a lake. So what is it doing? It's causing mitosis or proliferation of the granulosa cells. It's causing, you see this pink membrane right there? When it goes from a primary to an early secondary, it leads to the formation of a zona pellucida, which is also in late secondary and graphene. It also is going to cause the formation of these pockets of follicular fluid and lake of follicular fluid, which is rich in hyaluronic acid. And if you remember, it was responsible for converting uh, not only when it goes from primary to early secondary, late secondary, and, and graphene, it forms estrogen, right? At least the production of estrogen. And that was all occurring during what phase? The follicular phase, which was days 1 to 14, right? And who was the primary stimulus? FSH. And who else was released during this time period? LH, right? So luteinizing hormone is actually acting on these thecal cells, these maroon or violet-like cells. And what is it doing? If you remember, we had that diagram with the thecal cells. What were the thecal cells doing? Whenever they received the stimulation from LH, they were converting cholesterol into androgens, like androstenedione. Then the androgens went into the nearby granulosa cells. And FSH was acting on those granulosa cells, doing what? Converting those androgens into estrogens via the aromatase enzyme, right? And it was working in all of these steps. Okay, and that is again occurring during days one through 14. Now, what were some of the byproducts of these reactions I told you during their follicular phase? It was estrogen, right? Well, estrogen gets put into the blood. And around mid-follicular phase, so day 7, day 8, day 9, around that time period, estrogen levels in the blood rise. And look what happens. When it gets to mid-follicular phase, it comes up to the hypothalamus and inhibits the preoptic nucleus and the arcuate nucleus from releasing GnRH. It also inhibits the anterior pituitary from releasing FSH and LH. If you release less FSH and less LH, are you going to produce as much estrogen? No. So estrogen levels begin to come down. But, guess what? These cells, specifically the graphene, is still producing large amounts of estrogen. And this estrogen levels rise again. But it rises again towards the late part of the follicular phase. So like day 13, day 14, maybe even day 15. As those estrogen levels rise again, look what happens. They do something really funky. They stimulate the actual preoptic nucleus and the arcuate nucleus to release massive amounts of GnRH. And they actually stimulate the what? The anterior pituitary to release massive amounts of FSH and LH. But if you noticed, FSH is actually gonna be inhibited. So we're not even gonna really release FSH. Who's inhibiting this FSH? Remember the graphene follicle? As the graphene follicle is actually nearing day 14, it releases inhibin B. And inhibin B comes to the anterior pituitary and actually shuts off the production of FSH. That way the only hormone that's being produced around the actual mid-follicular phase going into ovulatory phase is luteinizing hormone. And you make so much luteinizing hormone that they call it the LH surge. And what does luteinizing hormone do? If you remember, remember it had, you had blood vessels underneath the ovary here? 
and it was increasing the permeability of the blood vessels on this side to pressurize the follicle and make more follicular fluid. And then over in this area, it was activating proteolytic enzymes to cut around the tissue so that we could pop that secondary oocyte, which was frozen in metaphase two out, and then eventually into the fallopian tubes, right? What else was LH doing? Not only did it trigger ovulation, which is normally around days 14 or 15, but it was also converting this ruptured graphene follicle, the corpus hemorrhagicum, into the corpus luteum, which is now we're getting ready to go into the luteal phase, days 15 to 28, right? And what is luteinizing hormone doing? It's stimulating the corpus luteum to produce progesterone, okay? So now let's follow this estrogen and let's follow this progesterone and see its effects on the actual menstrual cycle. Now, if you remember the menstrual cycle, it was consisting of three phases. The menstruation phase, which is days one to five, the proliferative phase, which is days six through 14, and the secretory phase, which is days 15 through 28, okay? Menstruation phase, you remember it was defined as the shedding or the sloughing off of the endometrial lining, but specifically what part of the endometrium? Do you remember the endometrium is consisting of two different types of like sublayers or strata? One was the stratum functionalis, it was the inner layer. This was the layer that was getting shed. And what else was getting shed with it? The spirally and coily arteries that ruptured, right? Then underneath that one, you have the, str the stratum basalis, it's the basal layer. This is the one that does not get shed. And it primarily is consisting of nice straight arteries. And what are these arteries branches of? The branches of the uterine arteries, which are branches of the internal iliac arteries, right? Now, around menstruation, you shed the stratum functionalis with the spirally and coily arteries. Then what happens? What, what days are we on now after that? Day six through 14. What was the primary hormone made in significant amounts during that follicular phase again? Estrogen. What is estrogen gonna do? You remember he's actually gonna proliferate and regenerate that stratum functionalis layer, regenerate those spirally and coily arteries that are supplying it, make a lot of actual uterine glands, not secrete from the uterine glands, but just make a lot of uterine glands. And what else was it doing? It was causing a thin cervical mucus production within the cervix of the uterus. Why? So that it was easier for the sperm cells to move up through there, right? Also allows for them to get capacitated, which we talk about in fertilization. So the cervical mucus production is very, very thin. Okay, then what happens? As we get to the point of day 14, we reach ovulation, right? So now ovulation occurs, and then again, what happens? Luteinizing hormone converts the ruptured graphene follicle into the corpus luteum, and then tells the corpus luteum to start producing what hormone primarily? progesterone. Now, I didn't mention this before, but there is tiny amounts of FSH that's also released and that can stimulate the corpus luteum to make a little bit of estrogen, but very, very small amounts, primarily progesterone. Now, progesterone, what is he doing to the actual uterus? He's even making the, the uh, stratum functionalis even thicker, so he's actually causing it to proliferate even more. It's making more of those spirally and coily arteries. It's also causing the cervical mucus production to switch into more of a thick cervical plug to prevent anything from being able to get up into the uterus where the developing embryo might possibly be. On top of that, what else was it doing? It was stimulating those uterine glands to start producing a broth or fluid rich in glycogen, lipids, and proteins, which provide a nutritive source for the possible developing embryo. Okay, and then you remember what happens. As you start getting to the point if fertilization does not occur, so if fertilization does not occur, in other words, the sperm doesn't actually fertilize the egg and you don't form an embryo that implants, what happens? It doesn't release human chorionic gonadotropin. If human chorionic gonadotropin is not produced, the corpus luteum begins to degenerate and turns into the corpus albicans and it stops producing progesterone. Progesterone levels are very, very significant and important for the actual spirally and coily arteries. Do you guys remember why? It causes the normal vasoconstriction and relaxation of the actual, uh, these actual blood vessels, these spiraling coily arteries. So whenever progesterone level actually decreases, it causes those, those vessels to spasm. And eventually they contract, relax, contract, relax, and eventually they rupture. And remember what happens whenever they rupture? The blood starts accumulating within the stratum functionalis. Okay? Whenever it accumulates within the stratum functionalis, they don't get enough oxygen or nutrients. What happens? Those stratum functional cells become ischemic and then necrotic, and then eventually what happens? It gets shed out. And then what happens? You start the phase back over at menstruation. And we also said one last thing. Obviously, a normal female reproductive cycle is at least 28 days. But again, not everyone's cycle is completely perfect. 
we say if it's at, at least 21 days, you get a little buffer to bond to about 21 days. Anything less than 21 days is now pathological. Again, you get a little bit of buffer greater than 28 days to about 40 days. If it's greater than 40 days, it's now pathological, okay? All right, guys, so we covered a lot about the female reproductive cycle. This was a nice overview. I really hope that it made sense. I hope it tied a lot of the concepts together. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. Um, Ninja Nerds, I just wanted to make a little announcement. I hope that you guys would just, you know, hit that like button and continue to hit those, hit those like buttons for our videos. Leave any comments that you guys want us to do any new videos, anything that you guys are interested in. We really want to hear from you guys. Also, hit that subscribe button. It really helps us to help you guys. All right, Ninja Nerds, until next time.